What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Honest Tattoo Word Podcast. We're so happy for you guys to join us once again, and we have a very fun episode for you guys tonight. So, my name is John Mesa, and I'm always joined by my co-host, Matt Triano. Hey, how you doing? And we're going to introduce you guys to our panel of guests. And everyone here on the panel is from the Kaplan family, and they all tattoo artists, and they've been tattooing all for a good amount of time. So, let's go one by one. I want you to say your name, where you're from, and how long you've been tattooing. Okay, uh, my name's Tony Kaplan. Um, it was actually 10 years this past June that I've been tattooing, so... Hell yeah, thank man. You, thank Congrats, you. man. Um, I work uh, full-time at R&D Tattoo, but also part-time at my family shop, Big Joe and Sons Tattoo. I grew up in Yonkers, but now live in Glendale, Queens. Oh, shit. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Next. Yeah. My name's Adam Kaplan. I've been tattooing 42 years now since I'm 16. Holy shit. I live in uh, Westchester. That's where I grew up. I'm still up there. Same place. And? And Joey Kaplan. Uh, tattooing 27 years. And from New York. Yo. Right on. Right on. Thank you guys so much for coming through. The fact that we got Adam Kaplan on the show, it's pretty fucking incredible because, you know, you can't get him to go anywhere. <laughs> that yeah, I'm sure everybody was like, who is this guy? Because we mentioned your name a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so uh, my first job ever, you know, outside of tattooing from my apprenticeship, Adam gave me that job. And I'm forever thankful for that because it really changed my life in the course of my career. So thank you so much, Adam. I want no to I wanna say that to you. I think the question everybody wants to know, how terrible was John when he first took him on? <laughs> when he first came to the shop, yeah. <laughs> not that he was terrible, but when he first came to the shop, he had a portfolio, little Playboy bunny, little name. But there was something in John that you knew that he wanted to do it. Yeah, and a lot of people in the shop were like, you crazy? You're going to let him, you know, he had like literally five, six designs. But there was something about John. I, I don't know what it was, but it just seemed like he was going to. He saw the potential. Yes. Yeah, the charisma. And then as soon as, you know, he came to the shop, he worked harder than anybody else. He'd stay late at night. He bought videos, you know, uh, he'd buy videos all the time. He'd stay late. He'd do free tattoos just to learn. And um, he got to where he is today now. Just work, man. Yeah, just it. work. It's like, you're not going to get it handed to you. Yeah, he proved everybody wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you, you got to do in life, man. You got to work hard. And if you really want it, man, you can fucking get it. It, it bums me out nowadays when I like see young tattooers just taking it lightly. Like it's going to be a walk in the park. Like there's not like another hundred dudes that are all trying to get that same dream that you want. And I feel like now it's harder than it was before even because the competition is so much bigger. You know, my art skills weren't that good back then. I mean, shit, they're all right now, but like, fuck man i had to work on my drawing i had to work on everything to to do this and now there's kids that come straight out of art school with like sharp art skills and once they get their hands on a tattoo machine some of them do well some of them don't but it's only a matter of time for the ones that do figure it out and they fucking crush it when they're like four years into tattooing it's and a it's, numbers game now too it's just the amount of people that are trying you're gonna if you're just okay back 10, 20 years ago, just okay was good enough, but just okay now with the amount of people who are also just okay and better, like it's a sea of people that you're going to drown in unless you really push yourself. You also have a lot more ways of learning. You don't have to get over that fear of walking into a tattoo shop full of bikers, walking into a tattoo shop and actually having to learn. You can go on YouTube, you got videos, you have so many different things now that you didn't have available back then. Yeah, and it's also easier today too because all these machines, you don't have to build them, you don't have to adjust them, you don't have to adjust your springs, you don't have to do anything. You just buy it, take it out of the box, put in a cartridge and you're good to go. So Adam, even when you know, I worked with you, like you still showed up to the shop early to make your needles. Oh yeah, I still made needles every day, made my own ink every day. I mean, I don't anymore, but I did, I guess like 10, 15 years ago. But I was still doing that, making my own needles. When I, when I got into tattooing, you had no choice. You had to make your own needles. You had to make your own ink. You had to know how to build, fix your machine because there were no videos. There was no television shows. Television shows. There was no magazines. There was nothing. You only knew, you know, what you were taught and what you saw, because outside, like my father's shop, I didn't know really anything else that existed because there was no other shops around. 
you know, so all you saw was what came into the store. And that's how you learned. You know, that's how we were taught. There wasn't like, you know, it was a handful of suppliers, but, you know, everything you really did, you did yourself. You learned yourself how to make needles, the inks, everything. So for the people that don't know, I mean, I know you guys story, but for the people that don't know, please give them like a brief, who was your father? Tell them a little bit about the Mount Vernon shop and how that kind of was a staple of tattooing for. Well, my father, you know, years ago, he got into it, I guess, in the late 60s, early 70s. There wasn't any really tattoo shops around. And when he first opened, they would close him down. He'd go to another town. He'd fight them. And then finally, we're in Mount Vernon, which wasn't a great neighborhood, but that was the only place that would let us, you know, operate and work. So we were there for years. And then, you know, over time, as things changed, then other towns would let you open. But there's still like where we are in Westchester, there's still towns today that won't even let you open a tattoo shop. Oh, shit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe Sleepy Hollow, it's still illegal. It's tattoo. still illegal to tattoo. Yeah, straight oh, yeah. up, you can't tattoo in Sleepy Port Hollow. Chester. Yeah. Pleasant, Port Chester, you can't Ville tattoo. Is just that one shop. Yeah, Port Chester, you can't tattoo. Uh, New Rochelle, if you tattoo, <clears throat> has to be on the second floor, certain district, and you cannot have the word tattoo. No advertising. Wow. There's still a lot of towns up, you know, where we are. Yeah. That they won't even let you tattoo. So how did you get, how did you start tattooing? Well, I grew up there. I mean, since I was a little kid, I always... You know, I'd always go to the tattoo shop. I would go there on the weekends. I'd go there after school. When I was, you know, maybe 14, 15, I started to, you know, show a lot of interest in it. My father would, uh, he would outline, he would shade the tattoos. I would color them. Then when I was about maybe 15, 16, I started doing tattoos for, um, you know, any tattoo, $10. Then by the end of the summer, I was doing them for half price. And then... Uh, by the time I was 17, I was, you know, tattooing full time as soon as I graduated. You know, the day after graduation, I was right at work. And from there, it, you know, I've just been tattooing ever since. And it's 42 years of tattooing. Yeah, 42 years. Fuck. <laughs> That's fucking wild, dude. Long That's crazy. Crazy. And I did tattoos before I was 16. I don't really count that, <clears throat> but I count since 16 because that's like when I basically started full time, you know, most of the time tattooing. Crazy. So I think it's crazy. How did you start tattooing? Because you're 10 years in. Yeah, there was a lot of resistance with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I briefly went to college. I had it in my head that first I wanted to be a writer. And then I got really into film, which is probably still my second favorite thing as far as like creative endeavors go. Yeah. I'm just an admirer. I'm just a viewer. But that's probably what kind of maintained my love for it. But that's what I was doing in school. Um, I dropped out. Moved back home because I was going to Pratt in Brooklyn. And then after moving back home, I got a job at a coffee shop. And while I was there, you know, I was really involved in punk rock. That was kind of like my scene and my thing. I played in bands. It was kind of through punk rock and metal. I became in interested in tattooing myself because I would say growing up, you know, you see what your father does. You really want nothing to do with it. You kind of want to pave your own path. But then kind of discovering it on my own made a very big difference for me. And I want to say the first tattoo I ever did, which is on a very good friend of mine, his name's Nader. I pretty much learned how to tattoo on his body. <laughs> and going into it, it was kind of almost like, um, I hate to put it this way, but just being around it for so long, just the idea that I had ex access to this equipment, that I could try to do it in the first place. There was like this bit of like a novelty to it. So um, going into it, I had definitely had a different mentality. But I'll tell you, after I pulled those first two lines on that tattoo on Nader, I fell in love with it and knew that's what I was going to do. You're like, this is in my blood. 100%. <laughs> Undeniable. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely no doubt about it. Um, and like I said, there was a lot of resistance. I remember approaching him about it, being like, hey, I don't think I really want to go back to school. I think this is something maybe I want to do. I was still working at the coffee shop, kind of like doing things after hours. And I think he entertained it at first because... Again, I think even he thought it was kind of like this, like temporary thing, like, oh, I'm going to dip my toe in it, but then ultimately I'm going to do something else. Yeah. You know, you've been doing but it for 10 yeah, years, man. That's not the case. Here I am 10 years 10 later. 10 years later, man. Yeah. It was almost like, um, some Michael Corleone shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> Where like I approached him and he was like, what do you want to do this for? I wanted a better life for you. What are you thinking? <laughs> you know? And I mean, it's given me a really great life. I've, I mean, I'm lucky enough now at this point to work with some of my heroes at R&D. That's fucking know? awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Joe, how'd you just get into up, this? Man. Other than just being part of the family. Uh, well, 
being part of the family, I guess, is uh, the How easiest way yeah. that I got into it. But I was kind of a troubled kid, got in a lot of trouble, spent a lot of time being suspended from school, detention. So my punishment was, okay, you don't want to go to school, then you're going to go to work. You're not going to just sit home and run the streets and do whatever you want to do. If you're going to be getting in trouble, you're going to go build machines, you're going to go make needles, and you're going to learn how to tattoo because you're going to have to do something. So that was pretty much how it started. Me getting in trouble in school sent me to work, which is why I have the work ethic that I have. That's funny. It's like most kids is like, yo, you got in trouble. You got to sweep the yard. It's like, no, yo, you're going to go no. make needles. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what it scrub was. My tubes. <laughs> yeah, go that's, scrub my tubes, kid. I, I didn't really scrub tubes, but it was more of, I need to send a thousand machines to the West Coast. So that's your job for the next week because you want to get in trouble in school. So now you're going to go learn how to work. You're going to build some machines. Yeah. Damn. Spin coils. That was the worst. I hated that. So that was the worst punishment. Having to spin coils. That sounds awful. I feel like there's tattooers nowadays. They're like, what's a coil? <laughs> <laughs> well, they definitely don't know how to spin a coil. I'll tell you that. I mean, even when I was a little kid, I remember being at the shop and he didn't want to put the needles together. So he tried to make it into like a game for me. <laughs> and he's like, all right, so this is the jig. You put the little needle heads like in each of the slots and then you solder this. And yeah. I'm like a 10 year old working with flux and like chemicals <laughs> like, like I'm cancer and shit like that. I don't know what I'm doing. I actually yeah. got a real bad burn when I was... I don't know, maybe 10 years old making needles. Oh, shit. I was sitting on the chair. It was so high up making the needles, spinning around in the chair, being a kid. The, the wire from the soldering gun was wrapping around my leg. I didn't notice. Jumped off the chair, landed on my arm. It's just sitting there burning into my arm. My dad had to grab it all. If you remember a few weeks back, we had Ed from Tattoo Armor on the podcast, and he was able to hook us up with a discount code for our followers. So Tattoo Armor is literally the best way to wrap your client. I've been using it. Matt's been using it. And it's just awesome. There's no mess. There's no glue. And it's just super comfortable. I hope you can try it for yourself and just go on to Tattoo Armor and use the code Honest Tattooer for 20% off your order. You guys are all in a family, but also represent different generations of tattooers. Like, like Adam, you'd say that you've been tattooing since the 80s. Since 80s. the 80s. Yeah, early 80s. You started tattooing kind of like in the 90s, I'm guessing. The 90s, yeah. 90, I, I think if you look back into, um, I don't remember which magazine it was, but uh, it might have been Tattoo Review, 1994, you'll see me tattooing at 12 years old. It's crazy. 12 years and old. And you started yeah. tattooing in the 2000s, I'm guessing. Yeah, 2013. Yeah. yeah. What would you say are the main changes that you've seen happen within your time? Of tattooing? Yeah. Well, the main changes are, you know, when we first did it, it was like a closed industry. You know, nobody told nobody nothing. There were secrets. You could never figure nothing out. You know, if you couldn't figure out how to get your machine to work, you could be the best artist in the world. But if you couldn't figure out, you know, the right needles to use, the right ink, the how to make a coil machine work right, there was no way to tattoo. And, you know, it was closed industry. You know, there was very few suppliers. And like I said before, there was no magazines, there was no internet, there was no Instagram, there was no YouTube. So the only way to really learn was trial and error, or if you could find someone to teach you. You know, now today, you know, it's totally different. And like, like I said, when we were, when I was younger, you had to make all your own needles. You had to, you know, we mixed our own ink. You made your own machines. If your machine broke, if you didn't know how to fix it, you were in trouble because you know, they, you know, the wires would break, capacitors would, uh, you're, you know, explode. If you broke king. a spring, you knew how to recut a spring. You're Adam, not Adam, Adam, well, Adam was the king of blowing capacitors. But you also way. had to know how to adjust it. You know what I mean? Just because you put the spring in, if it wasn't bent right, you had the right tension or the armature bar was too far forward, too far back, it wouldn't work the same. Yeah. You know, so that was like a big, that was like a big thing with, um, you know, tattooing. Because like I said, if it, if it wasn't adjusted right, it just, you couldn't get the same. You weren't uh, pulling a line, that's for sure. Yeah, you couldn't get the same results if it wasn't working right. And then also years ago, we also used carbon needles. We didn't use stainless steel needles. Nobody so, even sold carbon needles. You had to make Yeah, because they would rust. Like, so when you would make carbon needles, you would have to dip them in something, sterilize them. And uh, carbon needles would just, you know, they were better. They were, it was like a stronger steel. Yeah. So for whatever reason it was, we that's what we always used carbon needles and um, like even the pigments we used, the powdered pigments, like tattoos that I've done thirty five years ago, thirty years ago. Some of the colors are still like like in there and bright. 
You know, like I noticed definitely a difference from pigments we used years ago to the pigments that are sold today. You know, the other difference is too, like for today, you could buy a machine, take it out of the box and it's ready to go. So if you're artistic, it, you know, it's like, it's totally different. You don't have to learn how to use a coil machine. You just the craft take, part. The craft the part tattooing. of tattooing has gone, you know, to make a needles, the <clears> inks, that's, that's all done because you, now you just, you're a phone call away from anything you need. Yeah. You know, and that's what makes it so much easier too for people to get into the business because now everything's at your disposal, you know, at your disposal, you can yeah. call up, order anything you need, anything you could buy a video, you know, that explains everything to you. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, there was none of this. You had access to none of this. There's you one know. thing, one important thing that I think that, uh, people still don't fucking understand. And to me is some things like, how did you tattoo for like 42 years without the internet, without an Instagram? <laughs> how did you get listen, your business to keep going listen, for that when long? When I first started tattooing. Reputation. We used plastic stencils. There was no stencil machine. There was no, okay, like, like if you had to make a stencil to put on and you had to do like, say, old English letters. You had to draw all that by hand on tracing paper. And, and then, then, and then you would the arch acetate. it. And then God forbid it was the wrong size. You had to do it again. There weren't like, cop even the copiers didn't shrink and enlarge <laughs> when I was younger. There was no, you know, everything was done by hand. You and know, then, even the stencils were cut by yeah, hand. Holy shit. When yeah, I tattooed, we didn't even wear gloves. Tape. When I first started tattooing for the first, I bet you four or five years, I, we didn't wear gloves. When AIDS came out, that's when everything changed. When AIDS came out, yeah. When AIDS came out, yeah. When AIDS dropped, yeah. When AIDS dropped, well, totally. Like a product. It totally changed. It changed the way everything was done. Yeah. When I first started tattooing, bucket method. When I first started tattooing, you didn't even change anything. You would use an ultrasonic cleaner, and it was like a cold sterilization. This is how I was taught, and it was like a cold sterilization thing yeah and and you, you know everything would be rinsed out and you would go from person to person and that that's how it was when i was younger and that's what i was taught and that's what i knew but you know as soon as like the whole aids epidemic that was it well correct me if i'm wrong but wasn't there a point where grandpa used barbasol too we would use something use called acetyl side oh, it was a cold sterilization and you would put it in and that's why also we would Always use alcohol. You know, you spray before you start, during, after. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, that's how it was. And we didn't wear gloves. I remember we would be tattooing all day. You'd have gloves on your hands. You'd go and eat something. You wouldn't even wash your hands. This is well, the question. When did you get your first tattoo? Me? Yeah. I got my first tattoo uh, when my brother passed away in... Uh, 93. 93. Oh, shit. Yeah, 93. So you'd already been tattooing for, for how years. many years before you got your first tattoo? For years. 10, 12 years, 11 years, something Look like that. Look at that. <laughs> and I only got a couple, you know. I have psoriasis, so my skin is always fucked up. You know, it's always, you know, it's always broken out, so it's, you couldn't tattoo over it anyway. You do have like one badass koi tattoo by freaking- Yeah, uh, Hennon, Hennon Jorgensen. Hennon Jorgensen, yeah. who, if you know, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. Who's that? Oh, yeah. He's One an of the incredible best. fucking tattooer from Dutch. Is it, is he Dutch? Uh, Denmark. Uh, yeah, Denmark. Denmark. From Denmark. Okay. I, um, He's yeah, always with Mike uh, Rubin. Have a okay. close relationship. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Mike. Well, that's where I got tattooed. I actually got tattooed out at uh, Da Vinci Tattoo. When Mike Rubendor was working at Da Vinci Tattoo in Long Island, that's when I got tattooed out there. Before King's Ave was even a thing. Yeah, before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and the first time I met uh, Rob Ryan from Electric... I was lucky enough to get a story about him seeing you get your Eddie Deutsch tattoo. Oh, yeah. Eddie Deutsch did my first tattoo. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was working at, I think, Eastside Inc. Damn. Oh, my first one. Huh? One of these days, I'll get something else. Yeah, it's about time. Yeah, yeah it's about the tattoo. Man. <laughs> well, I'm glad, to tell you the truth, I'm glad I didn't get, you know, stuff years ago because my arms would probably be black when my father yeah, passed you, away. You look His like arms me. were covered. Yeah. And they were like, you couldn't see anything. You know, so if I got tattooed all well, that time ago, that's what would have happened. Well, one of my favorite things about his tattoos that you told me was uh, when he would uh, develop or mix a new pigment, he would test it on himself, right? Yeah. So he had a grid of squares on his leg of yeah, all Joey the different colors, about right? That before, yeah. 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 His leg. yeah like we also had a supply company, you know, so that's, you know, I had everything at my access from that too. But my father, you would buy, you know, pigments and he'd have to test them. 
So on his leg, he'd have all these little squares of different colors to make sure that it would heal, how it healed. And sometimes they wouldn't heal. You had to cut it out. The, <laughs> you know, the, the pigment just wouldn't heal. Yep. You know, certain pigments, they, they were too strong. They had to be cut like with white and stuff. Okay. You know, otherwise the pigment was just too strong. You know, but that's what it was like. Holy shit. I just had a, a client recently who had a similar thing, but on her ribs, but it was for an allergy test. And she, every time she got tattooed, she was like, just do a little square right here of a different color to see if I'm allergic to it. Yeah. So by the time she got to me, I didn't do one, but but she showed me. She's like four or five little squares of different colors on her ribs. And that was like her rib tattoo, but it was her allergy test. Yeah. You don't, don't really get that. These colors anymore. work on me. Yeah. <laughs> the oh, problem man, with that wild. would be is each company, each different ink that you use would be made possibly different so yeah. the color wouldn't matter i just saw an article about that pop up on me and it was about uh some lab made a study yeah, on that. like a bunch of tattoo inks yeah, saw that. and it said that some companies like some of the ingredients that they list are not even there yeah. and some that they don't list are fucking in there mm. and uh that's why the heavy regulation is happening in europe because they regulate things way harder than we regulate things they really try to protect their citizens from food colorings, from all these kinds of yeah. things. It's, it's wild. It's only a matter of time before it gets here. It's Listen, coming. when we made ink years ago, we'd have 100 pound drums filled with powder. And all you would do is you would take the powder, get an empty iced tea plastic container at the supermarket. You'd put the powder in. Some people used mouthwash. Some people used uh, alcohol. You'd put it in, you know, with the powder. Sometimes you put a little bit of glycerin, you shake it two, three hundred times, and that was it. You put it right in a bottle. And the more grittier it was, the better it was. But that's how we made ink years ago. That was it. It had that's a very distinct that was smell, it. too. Very Why the grittier, smell. the better? I don't know. The grittier, <laughs> you know, the grittier just the better I, it was. I would have to say it would be the amount of pigment that, that's it. just made, the, had more okay. pigment in it. Well, what pigment. someone told me, too, is actually Wes from Unimax, what he told me is, Years ago, when we used the powdered pigments and you'd mix them up yourself, where you'd buy like National used to sell them, uh, Spalding, when you would mix the pigment, he says that the particles were way bigger in powdered pigment than these predispersed. Predispersed. So that's why he says that they last and stay truer much longer because the actual pigment size, the particles are bigger. That's what he said. He said he did like a whole study on it. Well, I mean, that would, that would make said. sense because what actually happens when the pigment sits in your skin is the white blood cells attack it. And the reason that it doesn't break down is because they're too big to break it down. So if the particle is bigger, it's going to be harder for yeah. it to be broken like down. That's how, that's how laser works because the laser is going to attack it and break it down even smaller so your body can say absorb it. 100% juice or juice made from concentrate. <laughs> 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 I feel like that's the biggest difference between both, both those things. But man, that's wild, man. Like uh, I've, I've tattooed with powder pigments for a little bit and I did notice a difference in like how vibrant, like some certain colors would look after they sealed it, like got settled. You're like, holy shit, that looks yeah. bright and just so solid and dense, but the definitely a lot more difficult to put in. It's to hard put to in. put in. Yeah. It's a lot more work. Yeah. And, and you have to be a much more of like an effective tattoo worker. Cause you're trying to put these powder pigments in and you don't know how to tattoo effectively, you're going to chew somebody up. Yeah, it's harder to put in, but it, but to me, it always <clears throat> stayed longer. You know, it like lasted longer. Yeah. Did you ever use a blender to mix your pigment? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The guy that taught me how to tattoo probably started around the same time as you, and he would always tell these horror stories, but he would put, like turn on the blender and just yeah. powder would go all over the room. Yeah. Oh, yeah, our that, ink room was incredible. Yeah, there were colors all over. And when you'd go into the ink room where you'd mix ink, You'd be blowing different colors out of your nose because the powder was so fine. For a week, you'd be blowing the same color out of your nose every time you blew your nose. You know, and my, you know, Mikey Perfetto from Brooklyn. He was crazy when he would mix ink because sometimes he'd sell me. Yeah, you know, I mean, not sell me. He would send me, uh, you know, bottles of ink, and he would have exactly what he put in it. Sometimes he would put shots of vodka in it, and he would have exactly how many hours he tumbled it for, mixed it for, and uh, he was like crazy with the ink. But what we used to do really is just, you know, two, three hundred times, shake it up. And that was it. That sounds like making a fine batch of whiskey. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like it. people know they're like, oh, yeah, I put it in a barrel. that was this old yeah. from this wood that came from this forest. <laughs> and this is why it's like this. And it's been sitting here. You know, it's like uh, I think uh, what's his name? Phil Holt that made some powder pigment. He still has like bottles like Gabe has like a bottle of old gold just sitting on a shelf. Give it to nobody. He's like, I'm letting this thing mature. Just yeah, I still got powdered inks. I probably still got, there was this old 
Tony the Pirate Red. That was one of the best uh, reds you could get. I probably still have five, 10 pounds of it. And I got like Imperial Yellow from Hawk. There's certain colors. I still have like Florida Orange. And I once posted a picture, you know, that I just had these powders. And you can't believe how many people hit me up trying to buy it. Let me buy that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to sell it, but I still have it. He, the last time he got me to mix up yeah, powder them. pigments, never I used them. them. <laughs> begged me. Powder all over the place, colors. We mixed them up, and uh, I don't even know if he ever used them. Uh, truth be told, uh, all these years <laughs> later, I realized you rushed through the whole thing and didn't actually sit down and properly do it with me. So there's that. Nothing was ever clothes. properly done right. back then. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. This is how you do it. Any question I ever asked him, I don't know why I do that. I don't know. That's what my father told me. He says, you've been watching long enough. So yeah, yeah. When, when I wanted to learn how to tattoo, that's exactly what he told me. He says, you've been watching long enough. Go do it. Never showed me nothing. But well, that's, that's I, if how, I remember correctly, I showed Anthony quite that, a few times. That's how uh, I learned. You know, and then I, but from always watching. And then I grew up watching uh, like Louis Lombie. He would show me things. But you know what it is? The more you watch, the more you picked up. And like Zeke Owens, when I was a kid, he worked at the shop. I, you know, was taught a lot from him. Zeke was good with machines. Zeke taught me a lot about machines and how to adjust them. And I mean, he made me a machine one time. It was unbelievable, you know, but he was good with like the mechanics and all of that. He, I mean, he was good with it. He knew everything. He was a knowledgeable guy. He knew everything about everything. But when it came to machines, you know, he taught me a lot about machines and how to adjust them and stuff like that, you know, but a lot of it was also... You know, just, uh, you know, from tattooing all the time. Yeah. You know, when I was 16 years old, I was doing any tattoo for $10 a day. I was tattooing 12, 13, 14 hours. At the end of the day, I couldn't even see anymore. You know, but from doing all of that, that's that's how I, uh, you know, learned. The more you do, you know, the easier it gets. John, how long into tattooing did you start using rotaries? I started using a rotary when the Swash Drive came out. I tried it. I, w- I wanted to see what it was like. <clears throat> so when was that? That was like in the maybe 2009 or 10, okay. like the swash drive, like Swiss rotary tattoo yeah. machine came out. I was like, I want to try that and see what it's like. And it was like, okay, I just, but it, it I don't know. I didn't feel like, it didn't feel right. <clears throat> I was too used to tattooing with something that had give, give to it. So like when I used that, there were a couple of tattoos I did that just fucking, I chewed up pretty bad. When I, I started learning <clears throat> tattooing, like 2006, I started to learn how to tattoo. By 2000, I want to say nine, I went to rotaries and I feel like in the three years of tattooing with coils, I should have learned a lot more about how to tune a machine, but it didn't click with me. And then I went to rotary. And then ever since then, now, like whenever something's wrong with the coil, I don't use coils anymore. But when I did for lining, if something went wrong, I was like, I don't know what to do, man. I felt like, like, I feel like such a poser. <laughs> I'm like, I'm tattooing for 15 years and I don't know how to tune a coil machine. It's a really shitty feeling. Man, I tattooed for coils for so long and I, I really enjoyed it. I really loved it. It didn't happen until like, I started getting the, like the tingles on my fingers after long days of tattooing and just, I was like, oh man, this is not good. Like I would finish tattooing and I would still just feel the ghost machine in my yeah, hands and yeah. i was like i gotta do something else the vibration yeah man i was like this is not good yeah, i still use a coil to today i outline everything with a coil and then i use a, a shag built for a color but the shag built you know i still use regular needles on the bar and metal tubes so that's why i think it still feels the same for me yeah like the shag built was the closest and it works identical to like how my regular machine worked that's how i was able to use that but I tried other uh, rotaries and stuff for outlining, and I just, I just can't do it. Just doesn't work the same for me. What do you like, Tony? Um, I've actually gone back and forth between the two. Um, I'm definitely of the mentality, you know, anything has a genesis to it. So naturally, tattooing is going to change over time. There's going to be new technology, and you're always going to have people that kind of have that fear of the not so distant future, which is definitely a lot more scary than the far future because it's right in front of you. I say it, you know, really comes down to whatever works best for you. I, I think we all here know Tony Polito, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very famous Brooklyn Rest tattooer. There was a point where he was the only one tattooing in Brooklyn for maybe about a year when it was still illegal. And one of the things I've often heard him say, which is funny because you get all these loyal to the coil guys who probably really look up to someone like him and other old timers or like historical figures of that nature. And something he always said is, if it makes your job easier, do it. Yeah. So I would even fair to say if you had him tattooing now, like I think he would really be kind of like fascinated by these new types of tattoo machines. And I don't think he would hesitate to try and use one 
And if it's, it made his it job easier, he'd probably switch to it. For sure. You know, well, see you saying that when I was a kid, <clears throat> my father had a supply company and he used to make aluminum machines and they used to be real rackety and loud. <clears throat> and then, you know, we like I would start going to conventions. But when I was young, I knew nothing outside of my father's shop. So that's what I used. But then when I started getting out there in conventions, I saw all these other machines. So you know how hard it was for me that I, I would use a different machine. It wasn't my father's machine. But like you said, it made my life easier because it, it, to it, me, it worked. Yeah, better. it worked. So, you know, I like and a machine that I've been using. It's the same machine. I've been using a Mickey B machine for probably 35, 40 years. Already. Holy shit. Dude. Yeah, I still got the same machine. I was going to ask you, how, how many machines do you have at this point? How many do I have? Yeah. I use the same ones. Just, just Listen, I bought other ones over the years. <laughs> I tried. I throw them in a drawer. I go back to the same Mickey B machines that I got like two or three of them. That's I use the same ones. But recently he had one of those shag built machines. So I said, let me try this thing. And I tried it. And, and I said, I it's got to be a fluke. Back. I said, it's got to be a fluke. There's no way. It's his so I, I wouldn't give it back to him. And then I used it and I used it. And I, let me tell you, I've been using it. Three, four years now. That's all I use. Yeah, he, like called, for color me. And he shade. called me after he used it for about a week. And he said, thank you so much for this birthday gift. <laughs> His birthday's in November. Yeah, yeah. I think this was in the middle of like June. And you know what it was? When I was younger, I, I always used to say, I wish I could find a machine that I didn't have to adjust or a, a spring's not going to break or I got to, ch you know, change a spring. I, I, you know, I said that to be the greatest thing in the world. And the shag built machine works like that for me because it's like similar to how my, you, my, you yeah, tune your machines. How I call it, yeah, it runs like identical. But like I said, still with outlining, I haven't been able to really find any kind of rotary or anything that uh, like works the same. Thing. Have you tried a Sidewinder? No. I, no oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I tried to get him to try yeah, it. I didn't like it? Yeah, that's, I, that's so what I, feel like I don't know if I gave thing. it enough. I don't know if I gave it enough time. But yeah, I tried his. Well, the reason I turned him on to those two machines specifically is because you can hear how fast they're going. Yeah. You know, the, the shag built, you can hear, you can hear it. It's not quiet. Same thing with the Cuban. So yeah, yeah that's something that I think he relies on. That noise feedback. Yeah. The noise feedback. Yeah. But it's funny because he'll often talk about how a tattoo machine should hum. Some of the best tattoo machines I've ever used sound crazy. Yeah. You know, they sound like. <laughs> yeah. If it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, if it's not steady, it drives me crazy. I'll sit there and adjust it for hours till it's like smooth. Even if it's working good. It just the sound drives me crazy. If it's not smooth, I'll sit there and yeah, it's psychological. Yeah, it's psychological. Man, I I I've, I'd seen it happen when I worked with Adam. There were times that he would be in the middle of a tattoo and the machine just switched sound. He's like, nah, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're gonna stop. He'll twinkle with that thing. Yeah. That dude just sitting there bleeding. <laughs> I, 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 I left people in shit for an hour retuning re re my machine, retuning that machine till it makes me crazy. On point. Yeah. But yeah, you can ask them this. I'm the only one here that still uh, uses Kaplan machines. Oh, shit. Yeah, I yeah. still use uh, the East Coast liner and the East Coast shader. The aluminum machines, yeah. Damn. I used to use uh, one of my fathers. It was a... Uh, was it a Jonesy? Yes, yes. It was a Jonesy. I used to use the same machine to color and outline with. The thing you switch was, them up? The same machine. No, same machine. It put in a line and colored like you wouldn't believe. And then something came out of adjustment one time. So I said to my father, I said, can you fix this thing? So he did something. That was it. Never ran the same. <laughs> but for years, I used the same, uh, the same machine, the color and outline with the same exact machine. And what would you just mid tattoo, switch out your needle and your tube? Or did you have two of those same machines? No, no. The same machine. I would, when I was done outlining, I'd take out my outliner and then I put the shader. <laughs> yeah, it I worked mean, great. I've seen him in the middle of a tattoo go into the back and resolder the capacitor. Yeah, if it breaks, you got to fix it. He pops them all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure John has definitely seen him pop capacitor. Yeah. Tattoo. Yeah, yeah, boom, right in the customer's face. What, do you still use the same power supply? Yeah, the same from West. Uh, the same Intec one. Or same one. You know, it looks like a hospital one. Yeah, the Instec ones. Instec. Yeah. You remember those? Yeah, the the two thing. needles? That yes. One? Yeah, 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 the yeah. same big, big one. Yeah. yeah. I've tried other ones, but that one works the best for me. Damn. I don't know why. Yeah, I used that like, same power supply. I've never. What were the needles for? What were, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks very, you know, it looks, it looks like, good. you know, it's it looks good. I used, it does look good. I used the same one for all these years, the same one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody knows what those needles are doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's been using it 20 years. You don't know. <laughs> I would figure that those are like, you know, like when you have the, the EMS ones that had like the Hertz and all the shit that you yeah, could, yeah. so you could tune your machine. I figured that's like a, analog version well actually the that. one i have is digital oh it is uh, digital. Yeah, yeah the one i have is digital so it tells you the vaults right okay. 
Yeah, it tells you the the vaults and stuff. The other side, I don't even know what that is. Man, I remember but, uh, when I got that first, what was it the EMS 300 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. When I first got that, everybody at the shop was like, oh, look at you fancy pants with this digital <laughs> power supply. <laughs> oh, man. It works good. <laughs> Imagine now everything's wireless. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, everything is wireless. One of the owners of the shop I work at, R&D, Dave, who was also tattooing during the band years, you know, right before it became legal. They opened up the shop the day the band was lifted. He uses a car battery. He powers his day, machine so? with a car battery and charges it. Doesn't Gabe do that? Yeah, yeah he, yeah. he used to. I don't yeah. know if he does it anymore. But no, no digital readout, no nothing. All feel. Well, it's it's a it's a, it gives you like a nice, the most consistent. But now you can just get a battery like that's this <laughs> big and just put it on your machine. It does the same thing. Yeah. Well, years ago, that's how power supplies were. You couldn't. It didn't tell you anything. It was just you turn a knob and yeah. it was all by feel. Yeah. You know, when I first started, there was none of this fancy digital stuff. But you had this little black box and you would have a uh, sound and feel. It's all by sound and feel. You know, you'd run your finger over the armature bar. Yep. And that's how you would tell how it was running. Yeah. And, just and so let me tell you, when I was younger, Zeke, Zeke, he would run a machine over his hand before he tattooed. His whole side of his hand was all colored. He would, every, ta <laughs> every, ta every tattoo he did, he would run it like on his hand to see how it was running. With ink? For years. Yeah, for years. No, obviously no, like before the age. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> And then, you and then it's ready for you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> all right, back in those days, all the old school tattoo artists had dots and everything yeah, tattooed all over there. I still got some. I'm pretty sure yeah, got a couple got dots on me. Yeah. God damn it. Every time that happens, you're like, fuck. Well, I remember when he caught me tattooing myself. <laughs> you know, I thought, because he'll, he'll leave the shop and disappear. Be back, I bet I'm back in 30 minutes, right? I'm back in 20 minutes. He always disappears for like three, four hours, right? So I'm like, ah, oh, he's gone. I can do it. So I pulled down my pants. I put like a little stencil on my leg, started tattooing it. And of all the days for him to actually come back in the shop and not disappear for the day, that's the day he came back in. And I remember him running into the back being like, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. You got friends you can do that on. What are you doing? Get Nate in here. It was a guy I mentioned earlier that I pretty much learned to tattoo on. So, but I feel like it was like a rite of passage. I needed to do it. You know, there was a compulsion to do it. I knew I didn't have to. It wasn't like the situation that I think other people maybe have found themselves in where I'm going to do it on myself before I do it on somebody else. But, you know, spiritually and I think like ritualistically, I feel like I every tattoo to do kinda, it. they really kind of want to try just to see what it feels like to do it to yourself. But don't do it, honestly. I don't know. Well, I've always you know, heard I, 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 message, you know? I feel like how can you expect anybody to trust you if you don't trust yourself? Uh, look at all the people I've tattooed. They, that's fine. I mean, like I tattooed myself, but like, exactly. you know, if you, you want to feel you what, what it. it feels like to get tattooed, just go get tattooed. And then after you get good at tattooing, just that's your, your portfolio is right there. Well, well, I don't think it's a, as much as I want to see what it feels like, but when you're learning how to tattoo, I feel like you should absolutely tattoo yourself before you tattoo somebody else because if I tattoo myself, obviously I feel I've trusted myself enough in my skills with tattooing. Okay, I'm going to do it on myself before I ask anybody else to trust me to tattoo them, right? I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. You know what the thing I is, too? I didn't do it. The thing, <laughs> I did. I mean, I, but I also to... had to do this when I was 12 years old. I did the same thing Anthony did. I went and locked myself in my dad's tattoo room and I started tattooing my thighs. You should see my thighs. They're crazy. Yeah, my, my you know what the thing my is, knees are covered in garbage. You know what the thing is, too? If you're learning how to tattoo and you want to learn how to tattoo, all you have to do is go on Instagram and put free tattoos. I'm learning how to tattoo. <laughs> and you'll get a million people. Once you put the word free, they oh, don't yeah. care. <laughs> they do not they don't care. care. That's you get a, a that's, well, I mean, you're people right. that have come in apprentice, they said, should I buy fake skin? Should I buy this? I said, listen, the only thing that's good for is to maybe get, you know, like a little used to what it feels like in your hand. Yeah. I said, put a post up. Free tattoos. I'm learning how to tattoo. You'll they don't care. Well, as a kid, 12, 13 years people. old. It's true. That's what I did. I went outside the tattoo shop with a sign, $10 tattoos. I had 10, 15, 20 people lined up in five minutes. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that's, so the guy that I was tattooing today, he, he was uh, an ink master canvas and he said that that's how they would get people. They would just have somebody <laughs> stand by like, you know, a train station where there's a lot of people. Free yeah. tattoos. Who wants a free tattoo? Yeah. People just like, hey, yeah, sign your information, blah, blah, blah. We'll call you. He said two years later, they called him. That's, that's wild to me. That I thought that, that was wild Wait, too. That's, that's how they got him on Ink Master? That's how they got him on Ink Master. I mean. So they get, wow. they get a lot of people. And then after that, they vet them. You know, so like they get them like that. They get, he was supposed to be on 
the season before mine, you know, there's only so many people that they need. And then the next year, then they, they're like, Hey, were you still interested in doing this? It's for Ink Master. And then he was like, yeah, I'm down. And he just went for it. But just like, he had no idea what he was going to get. You just have to be open. So if you're doing free tattoos, you're like, yeah, I just want to do these things. I mean, people are probably going to say, okay. Yeah, no, oh, yeah care. nobody cares. No one cares. No, not when it's for free. I mean, shit, I see people getting shit now and they pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Some of these people that just start out, they're not bad. You know? <clears throat> That's like very slim, though. I mean, how many people start out and within six months can do a real quality piece? Even the best artists in the world. Some, some, there's tattoo artists out there right now that are incredible artists that cannot tattoo. Yeah. And I mean, I see some nowadays that are incredible artists doing tattoos that look incredible in photos. They still can't tattoo. Yeah. Well, stop editing. <laughs> stop editing. That should be a t-shirt. Honest tattooer. Stop yeah, editing. Absolutely. That's a good one. <laughs> stop editing your tattoos. Let us know in the comments if you want us to make that t-shirt. We'll put do that it. up. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Hashtag stop editing your tattoos. It's, man, it's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, I've, we've all seen photos that were like, no fucking way. And then you see them later when, because they always float around, but nobody wants to call anybody out. And then somebody will say like, dude, look at this thing I just saw today coming to the shop. And you're like, wow, that's wild. And then you do the research, you find the artist, you find the posted photo and you're like, this is incredible. I'm not going to name any names, yeah. but I've had some tattoos walk in here from some pretty reputable tattooers and- their portfolio is pretty good online, but in the flesh, it's just not that great. Yeah, it's night and day. Edit. Night and day. Stop editing your tattoos. It's just your skin is your skin. There's just no way that it'll have that shine, that texture. There's just the black, just the no white. Way. It's reality, people. Yeah. It's not Instagram. It's reality. Well, uh, that's why you see all those horror stories on TikTok, on Instagram. I went to this artist. I paid $5,000 for this sleeve. Their portfolio is amazing. How did this happen to me? Well, I mean, you're not seeing the edited version. Yeah, it's sad. I'm not even talking about that, though. I'm not even talking about just the tattoos just not healing well, not aging well. Yeah, people don't take into consideration a lot of like the structure that tattoos need to have. And I think that's why, you know, things like American traditional and Japanese tattooing and everything that just gets a little bit outside of that is the things that work. Yeah. The things that are super far from them. And I feel like, man, they might look cool and as photographs and as artwork, but as tattoos over the time, over our, the life of a person, they just start breaking down. Yeah, it's also else. still early to tell exactly what that stuff will look like 20 years from now because it hasn't been done for 20 years. So how, do, how does, I mean, we see what they look like in two, three years, nine times out of 10, they're not that great. But if you have somebody that really masters and learns how to use blacks and this to make them hold up a little bit better, who knows? Maybe they will hold up, but certain, certain things that won't last, you know, lines that are too close together. There's no way around that. They're going to run into each other. I it's think just there's the just a works. big change in, in society, society's perspective on, uh, on the craftsmanship of things. Like think about how many times, you know, people back in the day would buy like some high end made like shoes from like a shoemaker that like used the best leather he would take time making each part of it. So that shoe could last you like a really long time. And you had that one pair of shoe that you wore. And then you had like your week shoe and then your like Sunday shoe. But now people are like, I got like 60 pair of shoes, man. I don't care. I'll buy another one from Zara. I don't care if it- I'll black it out. You know, like they don't care. It's like, so there's like just a, uh, people just want that like instant gratification for something. And they don't really care so much about how long it lasts. You know, and I think like, it's just like the social perception is different than maybe it was back in the day. Well, I've been hearing a lot of the, um, I'll black it out. Like who can when you, when you, out? when you explain to them, I don't know if this will really hold up very well over time. You give them the whole rundown of how it ages. And so many times now I hear, well, I'll just black out my arm. I don't care. I don't mind that. Right. I like blacking out. Arms. Cool. Black out your <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I was talking about this with people in uh, my shop recently and kind of almost in this strange way, you know, like I feel like a lot of the reasons that people maybe got into tattooing, especially in the past was because it was like dangerous. It was an outsider thing. You know, you kind of wanted to be a part of that. You wanted people to look at you a certain way. And now you have tattoos and people don't bat an eye in a lot of places. 
But if you have a blacked out arm, that people might start reaction, giving you yeah. those looks again. And it almost makes it kind of like, you know, there's something cool about that, I think. You know, I, I don't have any blacked out parts in my body. I don't think there's anything like that I would ever do, but I like looking at it in this. I think the most extreme yeah. version is that some people like change the color of their eyeballs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like nothing goes instant. Like, whoa, when you see somebody with black eyes, you're like, oh shit. Well, what, the what about value. these other lunatics that cut their ears off, um, their noses off now? These people are insane. Well, <laughs> extreme body modification. I mean, these people are nuts. Extreme body mods. <laughs> it's did like you a, ever see the, the black <clears throat> alien project, what this guy did to himself? Yeah. I know. He got the little little baby hand now. Oh, he cut his fingers he off. He cut his fingers off. And he wants to cut his legs off. That's his next thing. He wants to cut both his legs off. He cut his ears off, two of his fingers off. But I mean, you see what this guy looks like? I mean, he's crazy. <laughs> he thinks yeah, he looks good. nuts. And, and whoever did this to him is as crazy as him. I bet you that guy gets laid all the time by women. Uh, they got some weird fetishes. Oh, like, oh, 100%. Yeah, he's in there. He's, yes. he's good to go. But I guess that raises a question about the ethics of something like that as uh, a person performing those sorts of things, right? You gotta be crazy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know? Be what nice. does that say? But depending on how you look at it, you know, like any kind of body modification can be looked at as extreme, you know, like when, even when people, when they're like, oh, look, I'm going to like, do you remember the first time that somebody was, was like, look, I really want to change the shape of my nose. And they're like, what do you mean? Yeah. I want you to, you know, cut the skin off, rip it up, change my freaking cartilage and then put it back down. Like that sounds crazy, but it became a normal thing oh, totally that people normalized. do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? 100%. So like the fucking first time that must've been wild. And the, the other doctors were like, you're going to do it. I'm going to fucking do it. If I nail it, I'm going to make tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well, they're, they're, they're making that money. And they're making that money. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had sleeves in my <clears throat> neck and my hands tattooed since I was 16, 17 years old. So. You've experienced the change of when you walked into a place and people looked at you oh, crazy, they, they, and now you they, walk into a place. You're listen, like, "Yeah, what band are you in?" <laughs> I go in. I, go, I would go into a mall, a store, anything, and immediately people were grabbing their kids, crossing the street. And I'm a kid. I'm 16, 17 years old, neck tattooed, hands tattooed, arms covered. Nobody had tattoos like that back then. The only people that had tattoos like that back then was tattoo artists. That's it. Yeah, but now it's normal. And, and some now criminals. Let me tell you, when I was a kid. The other kid's parents would say, don't play with that kid because his father does tattoos. His father owns a tattoo shop. Like you never heard of anybody doing tattoos back then. There were you, there was nobody. And they would tell the, you know, the kids don't play with him. You know, his father has a tattoo shop. Meanwhile, I never did drugs. I never did nothing. Never got in trouble. And then their kids were fucking animals. And then they tell them to stay away from me because my father did tattoos, you know, and I grew up in a tattoo shop. You know, meanwhile, now all of them, all the parents, the kids, they all got tattoos now. But when I was younger, you know, it was so stereotyped, you know, like when, when I would go to school, the teacher would be like, what are you going to do when you get older? I said, I'm going to tattoo. They go, no, what are you going to do for a living? I'd be like, I tattoo. I'm going to tattoo. And they'd be like, good luck. You know, you know, like they thought I was crazy. <laughs> meanwhile, we made more money than they did at that age. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, that happened to me in school one time. I hate like when I was getting to the end, I knew I was going to tattoo. So I didn't want to stay in school. And it was this math teacher. and. Broke my balls all the time. And I forgot what happened, but I got into an argument. And I said, listen, I make fucking more money than you do. You know, working on the weekends in my father's tattoo shop. And I never forget, she, she called my father. My father got pissed at me. I didn't think he'd get mad, but he got pissed. But I told the teacher, I said, listen, what do you mean? What kind of living am I going to make? I make more than you working on a Saturday and Sunday, which was true. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, it was definitely true. Yeah, it was true. That's the way to listen, when, the when, <laughs> when, when I was younger, we had the only tattoo shop. <clears throat> There was there was Spiderweb in Mount Vernon. There was uh, there was Spiderweb in Mount Vernon. There was Jonathan Shaw was like underground in uh, the city. You had uh, you had Stanley and Walter Mouse yeah, on Yeah, Long, Long Island. Island. You had a few shops on Long Island. You had Bob Roberts for a little period was in the city. We well, had Tattoo but, Peter, right? But Peter Poulos in Long Island. You had a handful of people. When I would get to the shop, like on a Saturday, there'd be 20, 30, 40 people waiting to get tattooed. You know, it was insanity. When I was younger, it was like, it was like this six, seven days a week. You could tattoo all night, all day. And it was like this for years and years and years. Like, you know, those big legal sheets of paper. Yeah. You would get the whole one side, the whole next side and half of the other side by the end of the day. The sign ups. Sign ups. Sign -ups I, yeah. I would get people that would sign up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and get tattooed. At one point, we told them, if you leave, you don't get tattooed. We would make people sit there all day. And it was like, 
me, my father, maybe one other guy tattooing. That's it. And we would tell them, if you leave, you're done. And you would just take the next person. And then after like a few years of that, then we would call them. We'd give them a heads up to come back. But I remember tattooing two, three in the morning, and it'd still be three, four, five people on the list. And I'd be praying to God, don't come back. <laughs> you know? And, and they, they would come back. They would come back. It was holy crazy. Shit. I remember tattooing until the sun come up. You know, you walk outside, you're like, holy shit, because we were upstairs. You really couldn't tell. You walk outside, the, you know, it'd be sunny out already. The birds would be chirping. It'd be like six o'clock in the morning. I got to go to sleep, and I'm back at 1030. Doing the same thing Five, day after day after seven day. Seven days a week. Well, when you worked yeah. in White Plains, it was like that. We used to stay till two, three in the morning. Two, three in the morning on the it's regular. Not, yeah, it's seven not like days that a week. Anymore. No. You ever ask him who uh, he did that exact routine with at the Mount Vernon shop? Who? Uh, someone by the name of Biggie Smalls. Biggie Smalls? Yeah. You ever tell uh, him that story? No. When he came to the shop? Yeah. Why well, you tell it? They, they were coming to the shop <laughs> and they called to get tattooed. I didn't even know who they were. This was like when they first came out. I didn't even know who they were. So they called the shop. They wanted to get tattooed. So they came up and it was at nighttime. You couldn't decide really what they wanted. So they said they'd come back the next day. So this was in the summertime. I was, it was crazy. It was busy. So I cleared the day, you know, and I wouldn't take anybody. And then they called me that day and they said, we can't come in. We got to go do some photo shoot somewhere. Right. So the guy, one of the guys I tattooed from some other rapper. And I just said, look, I said, I cleared my whole day out. He says, look, we're flying out. I think the Tennessee, they said, we'll be back the next day or something. And then uh, they didn't come the next day. And then they said something about coming the next day. So I said, listen, you got to call me and let me know if you guys are coming. So they never called. So, you know, I'm tattooing and the place was packed. All of a sudden I get a phone call. You were on our way. And I just said, I said, you're not on your way nowhere. I said, I'm packed today. You know, and I, <laughs> and let me tell you, I regret it now. I wish I would have did it. Yeah. But, but that's how it was back then. Yeah, hey, listen, Biggie. <laughs> that's that's not today. Actually, actually, he had a broken leg and we had another shop in Rockland and they wanted to pick me up, drive me up there because it was like a street level shop or something. Yeah. What was the shop in Rockland that you had? Uh, the same thing. It was. Oh, it, oh no, no. At that House time, I've been House of Ink. Okay. Up in Rockland. But we had a big Joe's up in where Rockland, was that? too. Right on 59. You know where the mall is? Mm -hmm. There used to be a strip there that they actually, the mall bought it out. And we were in there years ago. I used to have a shop with Scene up there, too. That, actually, that shop. No and shame. then Scene just walked away one day. But yeah, me and Scene used to have a shop up there in Rockland. Then I also had a shop on 303. That's Rockland. where I started on 303. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. We're in the strip over there. We're Bullwinkles. Mm -hmm. I used to have that shop. It used to be high voltage. It was a shop called high voltage. And then the guy Bobby, left. Do you know Bobby Safone then? No. Because he's the one who took over that shop or that location. Well, when I was there, it, first it was high voltage. And he used to have all this nice like airbrushing on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Was that still there when no. you were there? Well, it had all this nice airbrushing. And uh, the guy left and someone called me and said, hey, there's a tattoo shop, you know, for rent. And all I had to do was walk in. It was done. Just ready and, to go. And, and what happened is I, I went in. To the shop, I took over the shop, and I had a couple guys up there. And then what happened is they legalized the city, and we opened the shop in the Bronx. That was so fucking busy, it was insanity. When I tell you we opened the shop in the Bronx, and my father didn't want me to open another shop. He's like, "You're crazy, you're crazy." So I had to talk him into opening the shop. So I found this little place, and you know how I talked him into it. The rent was six hundred dollars a month, <laughs> six hundred or eight hundred dollars a month. We were on the, the top floor, the second floor, above a restaurant. And he says, all right, we'll take a shot. Let me tell you, packed every day. So I ended up taking the people out of uh, Rockland because we didn't have enough artists. So I, I just closed the store because it was worth it because I needed the guys in uh, the Bronx because mm -hmm. it was just so busy. You know, when it first legalized, yeah. it, was in, it was crazy. You know, so that's how I ended up leaving out of Rockland because I just needed the guys to tattoo that's in funny. the Bronx. As a matter of fact, in one of the magazines when I was a little kid, that's the shop I was tattooing in. Oh, the Bronx, yeah. 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 Yeah, it was a second floor store. It was like six, eight hundred dollars a month rent. I mean, you, you uh, I mean, the rents today are crazy. You the know? rents but today imagine are crazy. Six, eight hundred dollars. Oh my God. What a dream. So after mm. the, after you left the shop, I don't know if it was right after that, <clears throat> but that location became like a hockey store, like a sports store. Uh -huh like a dealer or something like that and they, they sold like but hockey. someone told me they opened another tattoo shop and, and then right after the hockey place so yeah, uh, yeah Bobby Safone opened up at a, as a tattoo shop again yeah yeah, yeah that's where I started oh yeah. yeah yeah we were up there for it was good up there but not like the city the city was of course when they first opened it was nuts right. 
you know, until I totally oversaturated it. How long did you work in Rockland for? 10 years. Oh, we didn't really? even talk about all the good <laughs> shit yet. Really? Well, what else you want to talk about? All the crazy stories? Oh, please. Give us one crazy tattoo story. I'll give you story. one crazy story. There was, there was this kid. Uh, I'm going to try to remember his name. My father was like notorious for this. There was this kid. I, I can't remember his name. He was tattooing. I wasn't in, White, in Mount Vernon anymore, but there was this kid tattooing him, and this guy wanted a cover up. And my father said, listen, don't do the cover up. You're not ready to do this cover up, right? So my, I don't know where my father was. I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know where my father was, but he walks into the shop and the kid's doing a cover up. So my father looks at him and says, I told you, you're not ready to do the cover up. He looks at the customer and he looks at the kid. He says, pack your shit and get the fuck out. Right in the middle of the tattoo. <laughs> and he tells, he tells the customer, he says, listen, he says, he's fucking up your arm. He said, I told him not to do it. He says, come back in a couple of weeks and I'll fix the tattoo for you. And then uh, another time, like my father, oh, he was he, he was terrible. He's tattooing <laughs> his kid. He's tattooing his kid. The kid don't stop moving. He tells the kid, "You move one more time, you're done." So what does the kid do? He moves. So my father gets up, wraps his arm up. He's walking out of the room with the kid, and the kid's mother's there. So the kid's mother says to my father, "He says, what's going on?" My father says, "Listen." When your kid grows balls, bring them back to the tattoo <laughs> shop. Yeah, it was like, you know, like he didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Oh, those, man. Those oh, the good story's days. endless, you know, like it's crazy. I mean, those days of tattooing are completely different. I mean, now you got to do that now. You have space. a picket. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when I, when, I, when I was young and in the Mount Vernon store, let me tell you, you asked the wrong question, you asked the wrong price, you got beat up. It was like thrown right down the stairs. Oh, yeah. It was like, let me tell you, that's why I never missed going to the shop because I didn't want to miss what was happening. It was like, it was like the wild west. It's crazy. Oh, you know, absolutely. it was like insanity, you know? And let me tell you, like, like another thing today, like people have no respect. They'll open a shop right next door to you, right down yeah. the block. Let me tell you back in the day, that did not happen. Absolutely not. That did not happen. You did not open up near anybody because you come back the next day and your shop would be cinders. You know, it just, it didn't happen. It done. Didn't happen. Didn't and happen. when I got my apprenticeship, I had to sign a thing that said I wouldn't work within like 25 miles of the shop that I learned. Yeah. You didn't need that back then because my dad would pick up a phone and you would not get a job from here to California. Yeah, that didn't there, happen. There was either. no waiver, no nothing. It was, if I don't want you to work anymore, I will pick up this phone and you will not tattoo from here to California. You better move to Europe. Yeah, that's how it was back in the day. It was like that. But it was that's like wild. a closed industry. And you know, you know, like a lot of people, the reason that they said that they would do that because what would happen is they didn't want you to tattoo nowhere. You couldn't tattoo in a city. It was illegal. All these other towns wouldn't let you. So they were also wanted to keep it safe. You know, if you get some guy that opens that don't know what they're doing and now they're fucking everybody up, tattooing minors. Now you got to worry about the whole section getting closed down. Yeah. yeah. So that was another reason they would keep people away, you know, but that's how, you know, that's how it was. Yeah, those times are, are times done. have changed so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think like in that sense, at least for the better, because at least now you can you can open a tattoo shop yeah. and know that it'll it'll stay. Yeah. You know, especially for a lot still, of like, you, know, many know, like, so, you know, I still feel the same though. Somebody shouldn't open like, you know, like right, right. You know what I mean? Like give some distance or something. First time I ever saw that was in California years ago. I couldn't believe it because when we were in New York. That never happened. I went to a convention out in California in the early 2000s. I saw three tattoo shops on one block. I couldn't believe it. Because in New York, that would that would never happen. I mean, in you the know? city, like I remember when I first came down to like um, 7th Ave, you know, like by like West 4th. And it was like tattoo shop, tattoo yeah. shop, tattoo, mm -hmm. literally right next to another, yeah. you know. And we had a situation here the other day where uh, some, these two girls came in. They were from Europe somewhere. And they were like, yeah, we want to get this. We want to get that. And, you know, they go like, oh, our minimum is 150. They're like, oh, how much for this? And I was like, oh, I'll do that for that much. And they were like, well, we went to this other shop and their minimum was 90. But you said that this one was going to be cheaper. Like the, the second tattoo was going to be cheaper here than it would have been at the other <laughs> shop. And I'm like, these girls are really price shopping the shit out of these tattoos right now. Yeah, But I feel do. like it's crazy. To me, that's crazy. Yeah. I feel you should get the tattoo where you're comfortable, where you feel you'll get the best work. Price shopping. I mean, when you walk into Gucci, do you say uh, the one down the street said 
ten dollars cheaper or Louis Vuitton told me four fifty, you told me four seventy five. It doesn't work like that. No. They're like, that's the price. That's the price. How do you set your price? Hurry up and buy. How do you set your price? Are you asking me or is that like yeah. a rhetorical question? How, how do you set your how price? How do I set it? I just tell them. I was like, this is what I charge an hour. This is what it costs. How many hours is it going to take? Hmm. Sit down uh -huh. and find out. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. I might, I might approximate that it'll take me two, three hours. You might start moving. It might now take me four hours. You might want to take a break every five minutes. It might now take six hours. I mean, it's kind of hard to guesstimate that thing. Yeah, it is. I mean, a lot of times, especially with, I do a lot of really big tattoos. So that I started just being like, hey, it's going to be, a lot of times, it's not going to just be tattoo outline shading done. It's not going to be that way. Sometimes it's, you know, put the outline, do some freehand, do a little bit of tattooing, freehand some more, tattoo some more. And that's all my day. You know, I'm not going to, I can't just charge you like a flat. It's just my time. My time is going to cost you this much for me to just devote all of my time of my day on you. So that's why I just charge. Somewhere along the line, people got into their head that, oh, you're only supposed to charge me for the time that the needle is in the skin. Get the fuck out they of here. Were, I had a couple of people who <clears> were like- It just took me six hours to draw it. Yeah, right? Where we would be tattooing and then we would take like a five minute break, like take a piss and the guy like, oh, you're not charging me for this five minutes, right? I'm like, yeah. get the fuck out of here, dude. Like, really? Like, you're gonna <laughs> I'll knock 50 cents off, bro. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like get the fuck out of here. What are you talking about? It's like, I can't be doing anything else but just be here with you right now. That's yeah. what you're paying for. Yeah. Plain and simple. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, this is something I've often struggled with, actually. Ah, you have the pricing. Yeah. Pricing. Well, a lot of the tattoos I do are often palm size or hand size, so it's like a one shot. And I often will go by a flat rate. But I guess uh, the thing I end up struggling with internally is what's the line that you cross between like not shooting yourself in the foot and respecting yourself and what your time is worth versus eliminating a demographic of people that you are no longer accessible to because of what you're charging. I mean, like asking, I want to be accessible to everybody at the end of the day. You can't. I know. So this you is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is, like, yeah. I this know. Is and I can't. This, this is something I that this, I try to do my yeah. best to walk that tightrope. This well, is what I go back and forth with all the time about Adam in the shop. I was going to tell you, that's when you have to switch from thinking of yourself as just an individual to thinking of yourself as being, you are one individual company. You are a company. Think of yourself as a business. You are a business just on yourself. I know it's hard to just, uh, but that no. That also brings up another interesting yes, you point are about branding. A business. You're yeah. a business. That's why you pay taxes like you're a business you know you you are a business you have to pay sales tax you got to do all these right. fucking things that a business does so think of everything that you do as a business including your pricing is according you know how many times like you know fucking years go by inflation has gone up the amount of taxes that you pay have gone up but did you increase your prices always because you should. I actually ask, just had this ask, conversation ask with him. Because yeah. he hasn't probably increased his prices in a very long time. You have yeah, to. Yell at me. They scream at me. <laughs> they're, they're so cheap. <laughs> you so have yeah. to. He'll price something. I'll look at I'll be like, who gave them this price? Your brother. I'll be like, Adam, $200. You it's know, it's going to take me six hours. I'm also fast. So I go by like, you know, I work. I'm fast. Well, so. I'll tell you that. It's like, because you're fast. You know, you can't like somebody that's fast. You shouldn't be charging by the hour. You're too fast to be charging yeah. by the hour. You're going to be giving shit away, yeah, that's what you know, I'm and you're fast because you put in all of the years and effort to be fast at your job, yeah. to be an efficient tattooer. You're paying for the experience. Yes. You're paying for the experience of getting the tattoo. And getting a good tattoo. Yes. Absolutely. And the experience, the 40 something years that you've put into learning your craft. Yeah. We were just telling a story of a, uh, of a guy that, you know, we worked with that did a tattoo and uh, you know, he was like four hours into a tattoo and you know, he, he, he couldn't finish it to the point where the shop was going to close up and they were like, Oh man, like we need to get going. You know, like, don't worry, I'm going to finish that tattoo for you. And then somebody else finished it like, like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that he couldn't finish that tattoo and maybe do the same job just as well. But experience plays yeah. a huge part on how fast yeah. you can do a job. So <clears> if, I, if you have a guy that's going to do your roof and he's just like, hey, man, I need you to do my roof. He's like, oh, I'll give you this price. And it's a cheap price, but it's going to take him three to four months. And yeah. you have a guy that's going to charge you more money. He's like, I'll get that done by next week. And you're like, I'll pay for next week price. Yeah. Every time. I struggled with that for a long time, but it's starting to click now. Yeah.
For real. For real. For real. Just like we were talking about, I was like, oh man, I could knock out that whole leg sleeve and like, you know, in just seven hours in a day. And somebody might have to do that in five, six sessions, yeah. you know? Yep. So and six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Even more money sometimes. Yeah. So it can change. Anyways, I think we should wrap it up. And if you had any word of advice or recommendation for anybody out there, it's a big one. It could be something fun. It could be anything. It doesn't even have to be tattoo related. But it can be tattoo related. I'll go first. Yeah. Stop editing your tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that 100%. Stop editing your tattoos. Like, let's, let's make that a big thing. All <clears throat> real, honest tattooers. Hashtag no more editing tattoos. I'll tell you one other thing, though, that I forgot. Also, years ago, you would never see a non-tattooer on a tattoo shop. You wouldn't see that years ago because tattooers would never work for somebody that didn't put their time in to, to be in a business. And years ago, you would never, ever see that. Today, you see that all the time. All the time. Yeah. But years ago, let me tell you something. If you didn't actually sit there and grind it out with them or tattoo, they would never have any respect for you. And they just didn't feel that someone that didn't actually tattoo deserve to, you know, own a tattoo shop. And that's how it was years ago. I'll tell you, you know? that. I feel like a lot of people that, and that those tattooers usually don't have respect for them. And they kind of, they're like, I'm going on vacation. I'm doing whatever yeah. I want. I just, they just don't have the same kind of like, you know, they still feel like I'm not working for this guy. I'm just working here for now. You know, yeah. like, you know, yeah. it's, well, you it's know a different it's, dynamic. It's a, it's a business to them. It's money. They, they could give a shit about tattooing. Yeah. Because all they saw, you know, and what they see is money. And they see how popular tattooing is. They could care less about tattooing. You know what I mean? To them, it's just another way of income or another product. Like, you know, all those stores you were saying on 7th or 8th Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those stores they sell are... everything in there. And the tattooing, all it is is just another product to them. Yeah. They could give a shit about, you know, they don't care. Yeah. You know, and years ago, you would never see tattoo artists working for people like that. But now you see that all the time. All the time. You know? That's so, it. advice to tattooers, or just in general? In whatever general, whatever, whatever, whatever comes um, out. Don't do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say anything on that. But do you have any recommendations on anything you've watched, read, listened to? Well, what I was going to say is, um, I think a very important thing that's being lost, especially with my generation of tattooers, is the idea of humility and humbling yourself. I think we're all very lucky that we get to do such a wonderful craft. And if you find yourself like me 10 years into it, you know, I think it's the difference between you encounter individuals that, you know, when they're interacting with a client or somebody that wants to get tattooed by them, they're acting as if, oh, you're lucky that you get to sit in my seat. You're lucky that you get to get tattooed by me. Whereas I think it behooves you to have the opposite mentality. You know, we're lucky that we get to do this because we have clients, they give us this life. And I think that's been lost. Uh, on a lot of people, unfortunately, maybe not as many as I'm like alluding to, but it's something I've encountered a lot with specifically my generation. And um, I don't know, something rings true now. And I know it's from old timers and it's something I've heard a million times and I say it over and over again. It's almost my mantra. Um, if you're going to get involved in this thing, you know, take care of tattooing and it'll take care of you. Absolutely. If you don't take care of it, then, you know. I think you're kind of like up the creek without a paddle kind of thing. You know, you're just yeah. going to drown in it. Yeah. Yeah. I think absolutely. Or isolate yourself. You know, you might be a rock star or some shit like that. I don't know. But, yeah. you know. You'll end up finding, you know, alone. tattooing by yourself in a private studio somewhere. Well, you should also respect, you know, <clears throat> the ones that came before you and paved the way for you to even no, have what package, you have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's times that I, you know, especially in the comments, sometimes in the, you know, I've, I've seen people like, oh, I don't, that's why I don't tattoo with anybody. And I tattoo by myself in a private studio. And I'm like, maybe it's not everybody in the other studio. Maybe it's just you, man. You yeah. know, I feel like some people don't get that. That's like, why is it that you had to go work by yourself and you couldn't just work with a whole group of people? Right. And I think you're going to stagnate. Like, I think maybe you get to a point in your career where you can do something like that. Yeah. Right. But often those people are at those points in their careers are still very much ingrained in their community. Yes. You know, they're still very much a part of like that tattoo community at large. They're celebrated by a lot of people. You know, these sung heroes of tattooing that we they're encounter They're a different the level of tattooing. Yeah, then, so they, you know, can, they can do that they at can that do point. That. But especially in the first 10 years, I even argue maybe in the first 20 years, being around people, that's how you grow. You know, you see, you 
steal tricks from all the people around you. I mean, I work with people who've been tattooing 25 years and they'll say, you know, they'll see something I do, you know, and it's this symbiotic relationship of like, we're all here because we love tattooing. We all want to be the best we can be at it. And, uh, you know, kind of like that tight knit community and being there for each other, I think is a really important aspect of this thing that again, yeah, you find people kind of like not really being a part of and isolating themselves. Yes. And which is strange to me. isolate themselves in any scenario. It's kind of a, it's a disaster, right? I think so. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect way to end the show. Anyways, thank you guys so much for coming by today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Joe. Of course. Appreciate you guys coming through. And uh, if you took anything from this, you know, podcast, I think it's, there's history, man. And this is something that we all love and we've all experienced at different times. And there's so much to learn from our past and so much that we can put into tattooing to make it be something better in the future. So I don't have anything else to say. I do. I want to thank everybody who supported the Patreon page this week. We've got four new people who jumped on. Amazing. And which is great because it was the first week that we actually added something in about a, a month's time nice. to the Patreon. So <laughs> Thank you. I want to shout out. Uh, thank you to Nicholas Soyemi, Kai Watai, Mothman, and Adam Macarita. Thank you guys very much for joining the Patreon. If you want to be like those guys, you can head over to patreon.com slash honest tattooer and sign up to be a Patreon supporter. Thank you guys so much. Be we'll cool. see you next time.